Perfect for families, with leisure centre, Sullis Cree Spa, places of interest nearby, Dunbrody Famine Ship, JFK Arboretum. Turn left for fabulous beaches, right for Hook Lighthouse. Brandon House Hotel, your perfect destination. For summer offers, visit brandonhousehotel.ie. It was 50 years ago today that Sunday Times magazine photographer Don McCullen went on a mad day out with the Beatles. See his incredible photography and choose from four collector's edition magazine covers. Plus, read official biographer Hunter Davies on the tensions that split the band. Only in the Sunday Times this weekend. Celebrate summer at Centra with fresh Irish pork chops half priced at €5.14 per kilo. Selected berries like raspberries 125 gram, two for €5 Euro or €3 Euro each. And until Sunday, Griffon Prosecco, Frizzante and Rosé, three for €20 Euro or €9 Euro each. Centra, live every day. Enjoy call sensibly. It's the 16th country I've seen them in on this tour jackpot. The lotto jackpot is €6 million. Euro. Play responsibly in-app, in-store, or at lottery.ie. Lotto. Time to play. Estimated jackpot. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. Welcome back to Saturday's Off The Ball. It is time for our Saturday panel. Um, today we're talking about dealing with early retirement and preparing for that and also about getting that work-life balance right for sports people. I'm joined in studio by Paul Corrie, former footballer with UCD, Sheffield Wednesday and Shamrock Rovers, the former Munster and Ireland rugby player Ian Dowling and the former Meath footballer Kevin Riley. Thanks for coming in, lads. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for having us. So, Paul, for anyone who doesn't know, what, what was your story? What age did you retire at? I retired at 26. Uh, initial injury was, I was just explaining to the guys there earlier, was uh, I ruptured my lateral crucial ligament, ladder, or ruptured my ACL, ruptured my meniscus, and ruptured the cartilage in my knee. So uh, that happened at about 24, I had two years trying to recover, uh, released from Northampton Town, came back, Simon Chumwick Rovers, and to make a long story short, I, I never got it right again. Um, I had PRP, I had cortisone steroid put into it. Did everything I could to try get it right, but it, just to match situations, it used to it used to flare up. It used to hinder my mobility, uh, my ability to get around the pitch. And then in training, I uh, close grain birthday on one one afternoon, um, retore the cartilage, went back in with Morris Nelligan, and uh, opened me up and said, "Listen, the crucial ligaments that were reconstructed are now in quite a bad state. Um, the cartilage isn't looking too good. He said you might get another year, eighteen months out of your career, but you could be struggling to walk and." in five, ten years, so with the background I had and the fact that I had a degree at UCD, uh, he very much recommended that I start, you know, making steps towards life after football, so it was it was 26, almost a year now since since I packed it in. Were you full-time with Shamrock Rovers? I was, yeah, um, I was full-time, um, pre-season went really well, training went really well, only managed, I think, two, two and a half games with Shamrock Rovers, so that was that was quite a difficult um, period of time. I guess from the time that I, I left the UK and came back to Shamrock Rovers, because I never fully got back playing, it was nearly like a gradual process. I could okay. nearly see the writing on the wall, and the minute I I retore the cartilage, I actually I knew there and then I'd done something. I put the bib over my head. I walked into the changing rooms. And I, I was crying my eyes out because I knew what had happened. I knew what this probably meant and I knew that that was probably the last day I'd have out in a training pitch. And was it one final conversation with the doctor that you can never play football again? Um, it was a series of conversations. I went back over to the UK to Andy Williams who was my initial um, surgeon for my knee operation and he's the top guy. Like When I was there, Danny Welbeck was in before me and Vincent Company was in after me so I was like, Jesus, I'm, I'm in good hands yeah. here. Um, so... It was it was Morris Nelligan and Andy Andy Williams were in conversation because it was between the UK and Dublin, and they were looking at MRI scans and they were saying that there's only so much you can actually tell with the MRI scan. It's going to take a minisectomy. It's going to take cutting me open to see what the actual extent of the damage is. So once I woke up from that operation, Morris turned to me and said, "Listen, it's not good," and it's probably the news I was expecting. Um, I, I'd probably come to terms at that at that stage because I knew in I knew in my own body, um, even when I hadn't torn the cartilage, the problems I was having, the swelling I was having on my knee, and probably the realization that I was never going to be able to get back to the level I was playing at in the UK, which was the, the championship. Ian, talk us through your story in those last couple of years before you were forced into retirement. Um, yeah, it was probably from the, the playing point of view, things were going well on the pitch. Um, starting away with Munster, so things were all good, in and out of Irish camps. Um, 
and then it was I think it was against it was, yeah it was against the Ospreys I ended up where um, it started off early on in the game just from kick off kind of caught the ball but kind of got ball and tackled at the same time and I felt kind of a just a bit something not right in my hip just felt that, a bit of looseness um, just like up um, gone again next phase just took it um, a bit of a tackle or a switch typical enough play and uh, just got tackled right into the hip and then just um, that's when just excruciating pain leg just completely just seized up and um, uh, I'm next off I'm off uh, I'm in an ambulance on the way to the hospital um, I have like a couple of scans there and I'm just thinking it's my hip whatever happens I'm going to like, get a second opinion and then between the jigs and reels of it, like ended up, uh, got uh, it turned out that it kind of like a, it was like a fracture subluxation, so um, of my right hip, and uh, so went over to you uh, to England over to credible surgeon um, Richard Villers, um, he was like a pioneer for uh, arthroscopic uh, surgery of the hip, and uh, so. Um, ended up where it kind of um, did one surgery wasn't really progressing uh, um, as well and so I was just rehabbing away and then was going back over and uh, it's like look there's something else we need to do here rehab isn't going according to plan um, and I was referred on then uh, to France so I was over to Paris um, and then surgeon there was did a couple of tests, uh, had an X-ray or two, and he uh, he just <laughs> as blunt as you can be. I'm thinking like, all right, we just need another little surgery here, and we kick yeah. on again. Might get in some of the sites around Paris, and uh, <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, yeah, you you need a hip replacement. I was going, what? <laughs> so he's just pretty fairly blunt at the time. I'm like, oh, okay, that's it, you know. And I think at, at that moment of time, um, your kind of your expectations are, um, all of a sudden, everything just gets, re you just refocus. And, and what was the timeline from the initial injury to hearing you needed a hip replacement? Uh, I can't remember in around, like I'd say it was September, October when I picked up the injury. Or, sorry, it was, it was 27 when I picked up the injury and then in a couple of weeks, um, just turned 28, had the first surgery, and uh, I'd retired at the, just at that stage, maybe before the or by the end of the season, I'd, I'd retired. You know, um, I was quite I was quite fortunate in that, like my my agent Ryan Constable at the time and Hamish Adams, um, with the uh, Irupa as it was then, the rugby players Ireland group now, um, they were they were they were kind of giving you that. Um, I, sp I suppose a, f a few of the home truths and kind of telling you what you didn't want to hear but needed to hear. Like um, what? Um, just kind of timelines and contracts and you know, I suppose cover and uh, um, the, these sort of, of things. You know, they're they're kind of looking. Your your focus is just getting back on the pitch. Mm. Um, their focus is kind of when things aren't going according to plan. Is kind of okay. Um, he isn't thinking about it now, but. When, when the time does come, he needs to be kind of in two years time when you have no contract with Munster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, even at that time, I think there was a your, your cover was up. Was it six or eight months? I can't remember. You know, and then they could cut your contract to it was maybe twenty five percent. You know, which all of a sudden brings a massive amount of uh, another shift in pressure. You know, but like from the medical care side of things, I got the best. Um, I, well, I feel I walk away kind of from the injury, knowing that like I kind of I gave it everything in terms of trying to get back, and I mean the the standard of care that I think I I got at the time, you know, was was brilliant. So, I, and from when you first picked up the injury, did you ever get back on the training pitch? No, no, I was like I was literally it was um, like on say the week before I, I'm everything and then like on Monday I'm I'm literally hobbling I'm, I'm trying to go into the gym I was locked uh, like I was bent over because the just the hip had just uh, completely seized and uh, um, 
uh, like uh, I remember going into the gym to try and even do uh, like get going squats and um, like it was just all sorts of um, resistance bands just to try and help me kind of just to to get me going you know like just uh, you, you can't yeah you can't, you can't compare like literally in the space of you know like 72 hours say from one training week to the other two you, you can't compare the two people pretty much you know yeah Kevin I, I know there was a long list of injuries you, you might go through some of them and, and ultimately what forced you to give up Gaelic football sure yeah I've, I've been unfortunate I suppose over the years um, between one thing or another I think uh, back in 2008 I had a partial discectomy um, just one of the discs were uh, bulging out, causing pain, um, limited movement in the lower limbs and I had to get that sorted out. Uh, I think in 2012 I'd, I'd surgery on my Achilles. Um, again, just I, I, I brought it to the point where I wasn't able to walk any, anymore and something needed to be done. Uh, so I had to get that kind of tidied up as well. But it was really my, my hip that finished me in the end. So. Um, in 2014, we played Dublin in the Leinster final in Croke Park, and about 15 minutes in, um, chasing after a ball, just felt something go on the hip, um, and I knew things weren't right. Um, now, whether it was being stubborn or whether it was just in the zone at the time, I, I played on. Um, I got to half time, got into the dressing room, and got the doctor and the physio to have a look at it. Uh, they didn't want me to go back out. There was no way that I wasn't going back out. Um, so I got a got a shot and headed out and finished off the rest of the game. Um, the next day, I went to Kappa for a scan. Um, in fairness to Jerry McEntee, he, he, he was looking after me and tried to get me in as quick as possible. Um, and in fairness to the surgeon who saw me that day for the scan, he said, you know what, when Jerry McEntee rings, you answer and you do whatever he says. Um, so with that, uh, you know, I, I was looked after, got the scan done, showed up that I had torn my hip flexor, but it also showed um, some chronic, chronic degeneration of the hip joint. Um, that came out of the blue to me, but in reality it was ongoing over a number of years. Um, and an injury that we hear an awful lot about now, particularly for GEA players. Sure, sure. Um, had, you, had you any pain previously in your hip? Yeah, um, the, you know, when you're stretching, maybe a groin stretch or a hip flexor stretch, that you'd feel a pinch, but because it never stopped me or really restricted me, you just kind of f forgot about it, you know, you just got on with it. Um, but obviously, over the years, it was just wearing down, and, and that was going on, um, I suppose, underneath the surface. So what was the end result then when yeah. you went in the day after the Leinster final? So I had the scan, and it showed up that you know most of the cartilage was gone, um, that there was a lot of damage done. Um, so I went and uh, saw, saw a surgeon. Um, he asked me how long I was playing. Um, it was 10 years at the time, and he said, just very bluntly, um, you won't be playing much longer. Um, so that was, uh, my, I suppose my world fell apart right there in the seat. Um, you know, football was a huge part of my life. Um, you know, and at 29, you felt like you were in your prime. I was playing well at the time, captain of the team. Um, and then, you know, for it to be all pulled away from you was a bit of a shock. Um, so I went and got a second opinion, um, and unfortunately, um, Dr. Jonathan Bunn um, had the same opinion. Um, you know, he 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 asked me, you know, what do you want from this? Um, and obviously, you wanted to go back and play at the at the highest level. Um, and you know, he was talking about more quality of life and making sure that. Um, you're able to do the day-to-day -day things, that you're able to exercise recreationally, um, that sort of stuff. So um, I went in in November and uh, had a hip atroscopy. Um, he reshaped the hip joint, um, did a microfracture on the surface, um, just trying to regenerate some cartilage um, and then tidy up, tidied up any other kind of bits and pieces around there as well, like the labral tear that that had to be taken out. So, um, yeah, so with the result of that, again, being stubborn, I didn't want that to be it. I wanted to have a go again. So in 2015, I spent most of the season rehabbing. Um, I trained twice 
fully with the squad all year. Um, and then, I suppose, between one thing or another, I found myself playing in a Leinster Championship match um, against Westmeads. I was playing centre-half back, having trained twice all year. Um, you know, I kept myself well. I did everything that I could off the pitch um, to ensure that I had a good chance on the pitch. Um, now, there was a huge amount of hours going into that, um, a huge amount of mental work to be done on that, that side of things. And I got, I got back playing. Um, didn't last very long. Um, I knew I wasn't right. I knew I wasn't able to give as much as I could or as much as I'd like to think I should be able to. Um, so I played a couple of games that, that year and I had to finish up after that. And what sort of state of mind were you in that season when you're only at the couple of full training sessions? Are you hiding it from people that I'm not right? Were you totally honest with everybody around the camp or were you totally honest with yourself? Um, well, I think uh, as, as sports people, I think and we're, we're driven to succeed and driven to perform. And I think you need to put everything else at the back of your mind. If this is a decision that you make that you are going to compete and you're going to try and get back there, well then all these little doubts mm. need to go to the back of your mind or else you just won't be able to do it. It's just not a, not a thing. Um, I had some marvellous support from the medical team. Uh, Barry McEntee, the physio, put in hours and hours of work uh, with me to ensure we, we gave it a chance, you know. So the two of us said, look, we'll see how far we can take this. Um, obviously, within reason not to, you know, do any more damage, but um, we said we'd give it a go. And look, I got to finish on my own terms, which is huge. Um, but very much so, you know, even since, it's a bit like a grieving process, you know, when you spend so much time, when it, you know, is the main part of your life for a lot of years, um, and next thing it's gone. It, there is a process that you have to go through. Um, and you know you have to come to terms with it like everything else um, and there's, there's a huge void there mm. um, you know when you stop you know and all the errors that you put into this the next thing it's gone um, you have so much time it's great but in one way but <laughs> so much of your we, identity is tied up with being the Mead football captain absolutely um, absolutely and you need to reframe uh, your thinking, your your mindset, um, and and your perspective on things. Then, so that takes a little bit of time. There's a lot of things in that that I want to get into. Just just one part. So you obviously have a very serious injury, and there's a part of wanting to get back playing for Meath. But when you're having the conversations about the doctor saying, "Well, actually, my priority is long term," and you having a good day to day, healthy state of living, that in 20 years' time you can go and play football with your kids and not be worried about it. Sure. Even when you're hearing that, it's still your main focus. I want to get back on the pitch and play mead. I will suffer the sacrifices if needs be. At the time it was, yeah. Um, maybe that's foolish. Um, you know, looking back on it now, yeah, like, uh, you need to be looking after yourself and looking after number one. But when, when you're so engrossed in it and you have that love for GA in general, but me, GA, and your club, um, you want to do your very best and you know you want to give yourself a chance to get back there um you know it does hit home when he he says that you know you'll get maybe seven years out of that hip before you need a hip replacement if you go back that time is going to be uh, less and less um and everything that you do on it considering the state um, that it's in and the, the lack of cartilage in it, well, you're just going to wear it down. So it's only a matter of time before you will have to get it replaced. What you do between that is your decision. Have you had it replaced? It, not yet. There, there is a, like, a, with, with all injuries though, isn't it? Like, it's like, kind of, that's it, like, surgeon or something, uh, regardless of the injury, you're like told, all right, it's going to take you eight weeks. <laughs> I accept your challenge, so I'm going to be there in six <laughs> yeah. weeks. You, you know, there, there is that mentality. They're being conservative in their approach. Yeah, so. yeah, you know, like, they're, um, whereas, like, the mindset when you're engrossed in it is that, like, no, no, like, they're, there's a European Cup semi-final, like, so, uh, uh, no, we won't be doing that. And I, I think, oh, like, because um, now on the other side of it, uh, like, uh, I'm a physio now, so it's kind of, it's not saying no, but you, you want to either um, have either confidence or kind of confirmation that you're not right, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like confidence and you're showing it, uh, you're going through the rehab, 
so you can go out into the pitch and you can perform after the injury, you know, because it's, you see where guys, they're injured and, oh, he's starting, but he goes out and he labours and, mm. you know, that's when you're, you're not doing the team uh, as much as you think by being out there, you're probably doing the team a disservice by actually kind of not giving the guy next in line that chance, you know, despite all your, your, your work, you know. We need to take a very quick break, but we've got a good sense of why he ended up having to retire at, at such a young age. Uh, we're joined in the studio by Paul Curry, Ian Dowling and Kevin Riley. 53106 is the text number. We're live on all our social channels as well, on Facebook, on YouTube and on Twitter. The Saturday panel brought to you this afternoon with Screwfix.ie championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. Do get in touch. 53106 is the text number. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. Join the conversation. Text us on 53106. Texts cost 30 cent. We all want to build a better health service, and to do that, we need to hear from people using our services day to day. All adults who finish to stay in a general hospital during May are being invited to share their experience by taking part in the National Patient Experience Survey. Patients will be contacted after they leave hospital and invited to take part. For more information, visit patientexperience.ie. From the HSE, the Health Information and Quality Authority and the Department of Health. Fall in love with the lights and sights of a new city. Marvel at some of the world's most spectacular places. With Qatar Airways, you can fly daily from Dublin Airport to more than 150 destinations. Fly with the world's best airline and experience the skies like never before. Book now at QatarAirways.com. Qatar Airways, going places together. In a world where speed is everything. In a time where you want to stream and download fast. Prepare to witness the quickness. Virgin Media presents. Switch to Super today and get Ireland's fastest in-home Wi-Fi for just €39 Euro a month for six months. Coming fast to a screen near you. Search virginmedia.ie. Here come the super fast legal bits. T's and C's apply. See virginmedia.ie. 12-month contract. Connect to €40, €59 Euro a month thereafter. Ireland's fastest in-home Wi-Fi awarded by Ookla. Offer ends August 15th, 2018. Phew. With the TC Matthews sale on, now is the time to give your home a makeover. We'll help you find the right carpet, rug, wood or luxury vinyl flooring to enhance your space. There's huge reductions in store and free underlay on most of our luxurious stock carpets. Available in stores right now. The TC Matthews sale is now on. T's and C's apply. Today at Power City, get free nationwide delivery and free recycling when you upgrade to selected Bosch home appliances. To find out more, go online to powercity.ie or call in store today. You thought you'd found the best electricity deal, but you hadn't. Because our price check proves that only Electric Ireland customers get the best value year after year. So, if you're not already with Electric Ireland, switch now at electricireland.ie or at 1850 30 50 90. Saying we'll save you money is smart. Proving it is smarter. Electric Ireland, that's smarter living. Conditions apply. Direct debit online billing. Residential customers only. See comparison at electricireland.ie forward slash price check. Based on rates at May 23rd, 2018. Bruce Betting are one of Ireland's leading bookmakers. Download the Bruce Betting app from the App Store and our new Android app in the Google Play Store to see why we're giving you more. Bruce Betting. In store, online and now on your phone. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlewy.net. Skip the hassle of buying new ink with HP's Instant Ink, HP's Ink subscription service. Your HP printer detects when you need ink, then reorders more. And voila, new ink is delivered straight to your door. Plans start at just $2.99 per month. That's up to 70% savings and delivery is always included. Plus upgrade, downgrade or cancel anytime. Save with HP's Instant Ink today. Available at Curry's PC World and Harvey Norman stores nationwide. Terms and conditions apply. Get €2,500 off a new Fiat Tipo and a diesel for the same price as a petrol from just €17,995. That saving will get you a pram that sings lullabies, a crib with its own en suite, and a bottle of champagne to drink the day they leave home. The new Fiat Tipo from €17,995 plus up to €2,500 off and a diesel petrol price match. Visit your local dealer or go to fiat.ie. Applies to vehicles registered before 31st of July 2018. Price excludes delivery and related charges. T's and C's apply. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. 
Welcome back to our Saturday panel, joined in studio by former footballer Paul Curry, former rugby player Ian Dowling and former Gaelic footballer Kevin Riley. We're talking about uh, the retirement process and dealing with it and there was a lot of interesting things when you were talking through your various injuries that ultimately forced you to retire. One of the things you were talking about Ian was say the support of IRUPA and having that support network around you. On those initial days when you found out, actually, that's it, I'm not going back in, how did you, who did you turn to? Did you immediately distance you, yourself from Munster and think, all right, I'm done with this, I have to move on to another part of my life, or was it a sort of long grieving process? Um, yeah, starting with the support network, like, um, they were essential, I suppose, from my point of view, so family, friends, and we like, I had an incredible girlfriend now, an amazing wife that kind of was there um, uh, through it all. Um, but uh, like, f in terms of how I processed it, it was kind of I, I nearly there was a, sp a side of me that kind of nearly needed to kind of show I'm good. I have this. I like I'd, I'd already um, started back into college at that stage. I was in um, UL my first year studying physio. So I was kind of struggling to kind of keep up on the academic side of things mm. while I was playing because I mean, could have been, I was away in Edinburgh on uh, maybe the Thursday for a match and then trying to get, meet up with the, like the art, make up the demands of the course and all that while I was uh, trying to rehab the injury. But ultimately when it uh, fast forwards to the time when the decision needed to be um, made, I felt that like, I needed to make a, a, a clean cut, and like that was it. I mean, I just getting rid of little things that um, were like um, just getting rid of all my gear, you know, the monster gear. I can remember, but like just um, uh, I don't know why, but staying out of the dressing room, the, like in you know, you'd be after uh, after matches there when you support guys, but. Um, I think once you've left the dressing room, for me, it, I was like, no, you're gone. And like things like, um, yeah, there was just all the little um, gestures that the players did that I felt I, like, no, I need to kind of process this myself, you know. What sort um, of stuff? Ah, like whether it was like um, calls, like to come over, or, um, kind of stay in their like their house or whatever, um, and uh, like um, say like uh, Keith Earls. Um, um, after one of the matches came up to get and gave me um, the number 11 jersey and I was like uh, um, no like that's that's yours now you know you were looking after it. I had my stint that's it you know and for me it needs to be that raw that key you know um, and I was just like okay now I just need to everything that I kind of was as like you, you touched on identity and I was like okay th those traits that got me as mm. a professional rugby player a part of that golden generation um, say um, got to play with that golden generation all those traits carry over in kind of new career professionally and that was like physiotherapy it's difficult to all move jumping into a classroom <laughs> I mean you know but uh, it, it's can't go tackling anybody in the classroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't uh, yeah yeah you're, you're, you're the student whereas before I mean like your 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 weekly focus is on Okay, we have a weekly turnaround to getting one thing right f that will make the biggest impact on next week's result. What is it? And it's a dressing room where you're brutally honest with mm -hmm. each other, and uh, you know it, it's you're 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 incredibly passionate about it, and that's where you end up being direct. It's professional. It's not personal. But then you go out. <laughs> I mean, into uh, um, and, and that'll be from the doctor or a medical side that bluntness. Whereas I think in professional lives outside of that it, it's not so much the message it's how the message is delivered that um, can be difficult at times so on the and you probably had a house full of monster gear did it just need to be a complete clear out i need to be able to go through a day and not think about monster rugby or see sight and our sound even though you had this incredible career and you were such a key part of the fabric at monster which was this brilliant thing that so many people want to be a part of yeah no that's it. I just need. I'm saying that though. I'm like I'm living in Castle Troy, like the the centre high performance centre is like five minutes down the road. So there's no really getting away. There's only so many uh, restaurants that like uh, the lads go to and all that. But I, as much as I tried, um, but yeah, I was uh, like I just wanted a clean cut, get rid of the the gear, and um, that like the monster rugby. I suppose um, it was 
an incredible chapter of my life, and my family's life. Um, but um, now it's moving on, and like even to, I think won the the Magners League that time, and um, I think it was Tomas O'Leary could have been there as well. There was a few of us. He played enough games. He got presented with a medal. Or he got a medal, and that like you know th those. Um, that I, I gave that to my like my. Um, my little cousin, you know, like th those are things that if you're not involved on the day for a large extent, you know, it was someone else's. That, mm. That's just how I did it. Other guys were completely relaxed. You talk to Marcus Horn, he probably, st he's still wearing Monster gear from <laughs> 12 years ago, you know. Um, so, yeah, like I think each their own, but it's... And are you more at peace with it now? Are you, are you happier now going to Tobin Park thinking, yeah, I was a part of this great thing? Yeah, yeah. I think I was all I was always happy enough with it. Um, you know, like that, that kind of maybe is it the 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 ego inside of you feels like when you're injured, you know, you, you can contribute in some way, you know. But like, um, the more you, you kind of the more time you sp spend away from it, um, uh, the easier it is. But like, I enjoy going to matches. Love going to the matches. Love supporting the lads. And um, there w was opportunities like afterwards, kind of you know, um, in terms of doing some of the uh, whether it's analysis on TV or like radio. That mm. it was just that was a bit too raw for me because if it was in if it was in a dressing room, we'd be able to call it. But like when you're kind of, it's another thing when um, you're, it's a it's a friend there and and. Again, the message, you, you know, uh, uh, at times it can come across as you're criticising and it's a difficult enough profession rather than being criticised by friends. Paul, you're probably one of the more fortunate footballers who's forced to retire at such a young age in that you were at UCD before you went to England. Had you finished your degree before you went to England? Yeah, so I, I finished my degree, um, did three years there, had an offer from Brighton after my second year in college, so I, I turned that down with the focus on... You know, having that safety and I love the commerce degree behind me. I was very fortunate with the support I had from my folks back home and, and my two brothers um, and my extended family as well in that they were very much behind me finishing out with UCD. Was that totally your decision? Uh, yeah, if it was. If you decided I'm going to Brighton, would your parents have been yeah, supportive? Yeah, of course, of course. They always, they were always behind me and, and fully supported whatever decision it was. Um, what about like the dream? What yeah, about the dream of going? Because you don't know. You don't know it's going to come back a year yeah, later. That, that was always the, uh, the thing, I guess, is that when you turn it down, you're thinking... I might get, get going to get another bite at this. Um, and to be honest with you, I had enough faith in my own ability and I could see the progression I was making. Um, I was playing consistently in the League of Ireland, 18, 19, 20, against you know, good sides and the likes of Shamrock Rovers went on into Europe. Bohemians were very strong at that time. And I was very much holding my own. There was a lot of interest around. So, you know, I, I had full faith in my ability to get there. And once I got to that um, level in the championship, there was, you know, a process of developing from part-time to full-time football that took a bit of time and you know I got into the team I was playing along the likes of alongside the likes of Ross Barkley, Mikhail Antonio, Chris Kirkland, Anthony Gardner and fr from my point of view because it happened to me so young um, when I when I think probably on a scale of one to ten what sort of potential I reach I'm probably looking at about four and, and that's the bit that really gets me is you know what could have been and what might have been and you know I played with Robbie, he Robbie Brady, Jeff Hendrick, Conor Hoare and Greg Cunningham, Shane Duffy all these people are making unbelievable careers out of it mm. and, and that's the part that really gets me because I know I had so much to offer I know that when I wasn't even playing with, at Sheffield Wednesday I was learning so much and to go from from being on the bench in an FA Cup away to Man City in the Etihad to two and a half years down the line not being able to play, that's that's the part that, that really gets to me. And like the lads are saying there, I don't think I'll ever fully accept it. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to because there's not a League of Ireland game that I go to, there's not an international game, there's not a Premier League game that I don't look at and say, well, I know this person or I play alongside this person. And did you always feel you had the ability? Yeah, well, listen, I, I struck up a very good partnership with Ross Barkley. Um, I guess physically, I probably wasn't the most imposing. Um, you know, I wasn't the quickest or I wasn't the strongest, but what I lacked in probably physical demands of the game, I, I made up with in my understanding. I had very good creativity, I had a very good eye for a pass, um, and that complemented, say, playing along the likes of Ross Barkley, who was very dynamic. Um, so the higher I felt that... It, the, the higher you go in the game, the easier it gets, particularly when you've got an understanding of the game. The lower I went, say in League Two, the more it becomes a battle. And, um, you know, when I was injured, Northampton won League Two by a record number of points. And like the guys were saying, I just, I, I never felt part of it. There was, um, 
you know, we won the league with probably about six games to go. The trophy was presented on the second last day of the season. I was in the stand with my father and, you know, I was watching from the stands because I didn't want to go down there. I'd only played seven or eight games. I was thinking, you know, I, I don't want the medal. I didn't go on the, the holiday, you know, at the end of the season that mm. the chairman had paid for. Um, I was, you know, being released from my contract and I, I just wanted to get out of there. Um, you know, fortunately for me, I'm, I'm coaching now and I'm doing a bit of media work, which keeps me involved in the game because football has been, like the lads, ingrained in me since I was three, four, five. Um, I don't think I could ever fully you know, cut ties with it. And I guess my, my mindset and the work, I'm, I'm working with Enda McNulty now, McNulty Performance, and he's been excellent with me. The mindset that, you know, yes, I, I retired from football. It, that's behind me. It's to transition into, into you know, my, my new life and, and business and, you know, life after sport. And there was, there was a saying that someone said to me and said, the only thing that you're guaranteed as a sportsman is that you're going to retire one day. So it's, I was lucky I prepared properly and you know, I, ha I had the degree behind me and I, a good support network and I'd actually you know, surrounded myself with people who I knew were, could influence and could help me when I finished playing and, and that, that stood to me. It's interesting that you talk about what might have been when you look at the likes of Robbie Brady, Jeff Hendrick, Connor Howard and players like that because what I was about to say was actually were you in a different position where you were, would have been surrounded, I'm sure, in England with an awful lot of players who left school at 14, 15 and that football was everything that if they didn't have football, if they didn't make it as a professional footballer, didn't have anything to fall back on. They didn't have a support network. So they had that extra pressure. Whereas I was wondering if you had that extra pressure, if you always had that confidence in yourself that even if this doesn't work out, I'll be okay. Whereas a lot of these guys won't. Yeah, I, I had the degree behind me and that's, that was an, a, a bonus, but that's not to say that football wasn't absolutely everything to me. It was it was my life. It was what I'd done. It was my identity. It was how people knew me. Mm. Uh, you know, you're Paul the footballer. You're playing in the UK. You know, you're playing with Sheffield Wednesday. You were live against Leeds last Friday night. Um, you're living the dream. Uh, yeah, living the dream. Now, don't get me wrong. There's pressures that come with professional sport that isn't always the dream. You know, when you have a bad game and someone gets in ahead of you, it, that's very hard to deal with. And, and that took a toll on me. And that's probably the part of the game I don't miss. I don't miss the pressures or that feeling of coming home and, and not, um, I guess, living up to your own expectations. Because I set the bar very high, high for myself. And when I didn't reach it, that was difficult to deal with. Um, I was I was fortunate that I had that uh, safety net, um, but that's not to say that I didn't have the same mm. pressures. You know, when I was over there, it's not as if people were talking about the fact that you had a business degree. I was sharing a dressing room with Royston Drenthe, who was at Real Madrid. Uh, Ross Barkley was on loan from from Everson. Michael Antonio has been linked with moves to West Ham, um, but we were all we were all part of that same contingent within the dressing room. We were all pursuing the one goal, but at the same time fighting for the same jersey. So. Um, the pressures are always there, no matter how high I feel you go in sport, it's always there and there's always that pressure you put on yourself and there's always that expectation. And, you know, without ever saying it back home, you feel as if, you, you know, you're playing for your family and you're playing for your friends and you have the weight in your shoulders of that and if, you know, you make a mistake, they're up in the stands and they're hearing the moans and groans and, you mm -hmm. know, whatever words you want to put out there. So it's difficult and that's probably the part of the game that I don't miss in terms of, don't get me wrong, I love the pressure, the feeling in your stomach before you go out and play in front of a, a packed house, but not performing or not reaching your standards is, is something that was I found difficult to live with on a, on a weekly basis. And from the outside, it never feels as though real life and normal jobs, which you all move into, is as black and white as sport is and what success and failure is. So at, at the end of the week, all that work you've put in, is defined by the result and by your personal performance and you're judged on that and you sort of understand it where that's a harder thing when you're when you're working as a physio and yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no matter what you're working at it's a harder thing to define is, is that something that takes some getting used to yeah i mean like on a monday you're going in doing your you're doing your review whatever in the weekend your performance from the weekend and there's stats there to back it up um then in like again it's uh, like you know, you're going week to week, you know, so that those highs can be, depending on how far the season, how far you get into the season can be quite high and then, but then the lows obviously can be quite low, whereas in, I think, everyday life, you know, there, there, there isn't, it isn't quite so volatile. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, the difference between professional sport and amateur sport with the GA is that you have to go to work the next day, mm, yeah. regardless, and, you know, you leave 
the highs and lows of Sunday behind you and next thing it's Monday morning already and number one you have a job to do but then you have the interaction I suppose from a school uh, perspective you have the interaction of all the staff but also a couple of hundred kids as well. <laughs> your primary or secondary? Uh, secondary and you know not all of them in fact the vast majority of them wouldn't be Mead supporters there'd be a big contingent of um, you know people from Dublin in um, going to going to school in Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, you know you you need to uh, you need to be tough at times, you know, and have a, have a thick uh, thick skin and uh, wear it well, uh, so to speak, you know. But uh, your week moves on, um, you know, and you you just have to get on with it, you know. Unlike unlike you guys, that yeah, like I, I set goals and we set goals internally within McNulty Performance, and don't get me wrong, when you hit those targets and you secure contracts, it's it's a great feeling, but. I don't think you'll ever be able to recreate that feeling of, you know, scoring a goal in Crow Park or a try in Thomond Park or, you know, whatever that may be. And that winning feeling of stepping into a dress room afterwards that the work of from Monday to Friday or Tuesday to Friday in the lead up to the game and the, having that camaraderie around the dressing mm. room. I just, I personally feel as if that's probably something that I really miss out on. I don't think you're able to emulate that in a business life and, and taking sport away from it, that's probably one thing that I miss. Do you need to work hard to make sure you don't end up bitter about it? That you don't end up looking at Robbie Brady or Conor Herron and think, well, what did they do differently to me? I, I am bitter and I'll open right. it, I'm, I'm bitter. And uh, you know, I often think and I sit down and even before I came in today and I'm thinking about my career and I'm thinking about retirement and I say, well, why me? You know, before I went over to Northampton, I had attacked the gym and my body fat was as low as I've ever been, my legs were as strong as I've ever been, and a simple one-on-one -on -one movement and training. Um, I've hyperextended my knee out one way and then hyperextended back out the other way, two clicks, and that's my career over. I'm thinking, why me? Like, I didn't play for 12, 18 months at, Sh at, Shamrock Ro or at Sheffield Wednesday. I've come to Northampton to, to get my career restarted. Um, I was very much on the verge of getting into the team um, and then that happens, and I, I think, why me? Like, why was that not anyone else? And I oft, often think, why didn't I just let someone, I actually let one of the young lads go before me in the 1v1s, I think. If I hadn't have done that, would I have done my knee? And just those little questions and those doubts go through my mind that I f very much find it hard to accept, and that's why I'm bitter about it. I'm thinking, why didn't that happen to someone else? Like, I had so much potential, I had so much, you know, I didn't get to a European Cup semi-final like the guys did. I don't feel as if, I don't know where they feel as if they got in, in terms of their potential, but I feel as if I got nowhere near it, and that's the part that really bugs me. Um, you know, I see people, even on League of Ireland bases, Robbie Benson I played with at UCD, who's flying at Dundalk. I'm thinking, you know, I played with Benson, and their European campaigns are doing really well in the League of Ireland. I don't even get to experience the League of Ireland, you know, career as opposed to a championship or league one yeah kevin you were the oldest of the three here you, you were 29 was it when you were retired so you had a good decent spell you got to be the mead captain you got to play in leinster finals to win a leinster title back in in 2010 sure. is there still a part of you that looks at the players out there thinking that should be me well absolutely i suppose it's twofold um you'd always like to think that you had more to offer you know and when you finish unexpectedly um, you know, you're in your prime and next thing it's, it's taken away from you, that is tough. Um, and there always will be questions as to what if. But I think it's very important that, you know, when you are looking back, that um, we had a fantastic opportunity. Um, we're very much in the minority of sports people, and you guys even more so as professional sports people, that we had this opportunity mm -hmm. to represent um, our clubs, our counties, our provinces, um, our countries at times. Um, and to think that we're so fortunate to be given that opportunity in the first place and to, and to go out and play in front of 80,000 people um, and to do what you, something that you love and can do so well when I know thousands, tens of thousands of other uh, lads and I suppose uh, girls as well in my county would only love to be in the position that I was in. And the same with you guys. Um, there's millions of people that want to play professional sport. Um, and, you know, to be given the chance to do that for however long that may be was, was wonderful, you know, and you have to be grateful for that. Mm. Do you still, though, want that feeling of being the Mead footballer? All that time and energy that you put in, wh where does that now go to? Where does that go? Um, two wonderful children uh, take off most of that time, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, um, I suppose since then, 
you'd love that rush. You'd love that rush again. Um, and Can anything replace it? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> um, I yeah. Look, I've you know I've, I've replaced that time lost with some some um, I suppose other things. I've I'm managing my club team um, now at senior level. Um, I've done a few degrees in uh, going back to college part time. I've a masters and a few other bits and pieces done there. As I said, a, a wife and two wonderful children that take up most of your time as well. So. Um, it's it's great that that we get to experience other aspects of life now, and um, that you've the time to really engage in in these various things. Mm. Um, whereas before, you know, we were so driven, and that's that's what needed to be done. That's what took to compete at that level. So, um, there was a huge amount of sacrifice um, as a result. Got bitterness side of it, and, and Paul's been very honest on it. <laughs> there, uh, yeah. but. It, is part of you still looking at Munster and, and looking at, say, the, the way the late career flourish Keith Earls has had and the way he's stepped up brilliantly over the last couple of years and the opportunity to work with somebody like Joe Schmidt? Does part of you think, well, there's no reason if this hadn't happened and this hasn't happened that I, I would have stepped up to another level, that, that my career would have had a final four or five years where I, I would have achieved God knows what? There, like, I can look at that. Well, that was the goal of the season. I mean, uh, um, I was trying... Uh, just look, have as good a season as I could, and then see what would develop from that. It turned out at the end, towards the end, there was a raft of injuries, two wingers. Um, I think Luke Fitz and Dave Kearney, and there's there's a few more there. So there could have been, but like, um, yeah, like there's for me, there was just so much that was kind of outside of my control. Like the only thing was in terms of. Um, and in fairness to Declan Kidney, he he was a, he was a strong advocate of kind of life outside of the game, um, and uh, I, I, I like so when I was injured, it was always a case of okay, what am I doing outside of this to keep me kind of somewhat sane, you know, with any injury, and that was something Declan would have always pushed. Um, so I got injured, and I mean, I'm going into college then the following week trying to play catch up. Uh, some of the, the smartest kids uh, around into this classroom and uh, um, that at least kind of kept me kind of somewhat not content but a, a bit more ac accepting at that mm. time in my career or life in that I was at least kicking on in that in well, life outside rugby in the next chapter life after sport because like my back my entry into the professional game wasn't your typical I didn't come through the academy route I came through kind of the club game so that kind of maybe hardened or emboldened me to the expectations and to, to know like I was I was going to be um, a, a potential winger on the Munster team you know that that isn't you're not going to retire um, at the end of rugby, you know, and be financially secure or and all of that. Um, whereas I can see from in, in a professional game in soccer, you know, the the, the skies, you know, the the growth, the level of growth there are probably that bit, that bit, um, that bit bigger. Um, so I kind of, in terms of expectations, that were like my, I was quite set. I knew it. once I. Um, was go going to retire hopefully that transition to the next career whatever that was well it was going to be physio um, was going to be as smooth as possible you mentioned the work-life balance there and and how Declan Kidney was a great supporter of it they've done some really good work in OTBAM this week talking a lot to some of our athletes and we're having so much great success with our young athletes at the moment and they spoke to the like of Gene Acby Moses and Phil Healy about their work-life balance and enjoying their sport and also to the swimmer and diver Oliver Dingley uh, he was speaking about the importance of finding that perfect work-life balance it's great for me to kind of be in that environment now where I feel comfortable within that environment and it's uh, uh, but you know what, I think college has had a big part to play with that kind of, I felt very uncomfortable being in that, that environment with those divers and the same for college when I went there. I think last year I really struggled with a bit of anxiety as well so to be able to go into college I, I really felt like I, pardon pun, dived headfirst into it into college and uh, 
being amongst those uncomfortable, just finding myself in those, those uncomfortable experiences. And I, I felt that's really helped me kind of come out of my shell a little, hopefully. And, yeah, because it's strange when you think of like an athlete who's succeeded, who's an Olympic finalist, that they should have all the confidence in the world, but that's not the case. No, no, say, no. Like, I, the I get, anxiety can come from doing, I, just I, out of your comfort zone. I get very nervous, and uh, especially after the Olympics, I was really hit by the, by anxiety and nerves. And I'd have periods where I wouldn't go to the shop sometimes because I uh, just got a bit too nervous just kind of having people around me. Um, was and, that the uh, trigger for just being potentially recognised, maybe? Uh, or? Well, the trigger for it, I wasn't too well after the Olympics, uh, and I fainted, and uh, and that was the trigger because I fainted in public, and uh, and I found it really hard to come back from that. So you can imagine going into college, <laughs> and I remember sat there on my first day at college in the induction day, and I was I actually sat right at the back of a room as cl close to the closest exit I could possibly get to. I, I probably wouldn't have been able to do this a few months ago yeah, uh, when sure. I started college. I, I went for a really bad stage, and. Uh, and college has really helped me come out of my shell, I think, and uh, and also socialising with people. It wasn't something I necessarily was doing. Not going out on going on nights out, but just general, just kind of going out. For, for, my mates might be having a drink, but I'll go out for a coke as well and enjoy myself as yeah. well. And it's kind of getting in, pushing myself into those uncomfortable situations. I've become comfortable. I've become the norm. And that's kind of, that's really helped in my diving this last year as well, because I went through a stage last year where I was standing on the diving board and my, my hands were going like this. And you can imagine standing there and your hands are like this and it's, it's, it's terrifying, be, I'd imagine. It's terrifying. That's a good word to describe it. I was, I was going to say scary, but no, it really is terrifying. And uh, and I, I found general, general, I found general kind of life experiences quite terrifying, like going to the shops. So it's nice to kind of come out of that, and that's really kind of impacted on my diving. Just that extra bit of confidence, or just extra bit of kind of, it's just something extras there, and it's really helped me cut my shell, and especially in the diving world as well. Yeah, the diver there, Oliver Dingley, speaking to Owen Sheehan earlier in the week. You can watch all those interviews on upandofftheball.com. That thing there he talks about, even just going to college and having friends and a different environment, and it's, it's probably different for an individual sport like diving, but you can become used to the dressing room culture. That's not real life. That's not, that's not how people interact with each other in ordinary life. I, I assume when you're working with Elna McNulty, the conversations that happen in the office there are very different to the type of conversations that would have happened in the <laughs> dressing room at Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, they're a bit more PG in the office. <laughs> um, what I found when I, was, when I was studying, when I was playing at the same time, I actually found that my brain was actually more in tune. Um, you know, when I was having to use a lot more in an educational sense, um, because my game was so much about my vision and my creativity, I actually felt that the education benefited from it. Um, in the UK now, from being in, in professional soccer dress rooms, there is zero emphasis put on education in terms of, you know, Ian was saying in regards to setting yourself up for life mm. after rugby and having that distraction. There's zero, distra you know, zero emphasis. It's recover get to the next training session, it's matches on the weekend, and it's very much, you know, if you're good enough, we'll, we'll sign you another contract, and if it's not, you're very much put to the side. And is that that they can still sell the dream? That football, there's so much wealth and money involved in football now, that if you do make it to the Premier League, you probably will never have to work again, because you're, if you're on 20, 30 grand a week, you'll probably be able to work your way when you can retire at 35. Mm -hmm. You can actually retire where for other sports that's simply not the case that that's how they can somehow get away with not educating these kids who are in their academies absolutely you know i'm not saying you're encouraged to put all your eggs in one basket but if you have 10 15 good games and lead up to a transfer window there's a high chance if you're banging in goals and creating chances there's a mm. good chance that you're going to make a move to a premier league team and what you find is that when you get into that bubble of 30, 40, 50 grand a week, it's very difficult to come out of it. You know, your next contract might be 25, 20, but if you're soaking that up for six, seven, eight years, well, that's that's serious basis to, to go by and a serious foundation to build upon for the rest of your life. It, it um, does feel as though that in both rugby and in GEA with the work done by the GPA and with a lot of the scholarships that we're very good at that in those two sports and really heading in that direction that you do have that balance of getting your education in even though if the time commitments are becoming greater and greater particularly in Gaelic football is it still a huge issue in football I was out in UCD last night watching watching that team and they play mm. some lovely football and you can't um, in front of a tiny crowd probably a hundred people out there but you do look and think this has to be the example of these guys are all here in college F football's miles behind absolutely miles behind I wrote a column earlier on in the year and uh professional rugby players it's between 90 and 95 percent of a third level degree in professional football uh, here alone in ireland it's in around 30 and 40 you know so 
the wages between rugby and Ireland are a completely different spectrum. The rugby boys are making much more money. Now, when you go to the UK again, it's it's just so cutthroat. Um, you know, I never receive a phone call from anybody from Northampton to see who I am. You know, see how my new career is, see how my knee is. You don't, you just don't get it. You are literally a piece of meat in football. Mm. And as players, you just have to accept it. It's it's very much in your hands to set yourself up for success after sport and uh, it's probably something that's neglected it's it's a lower class sport particularly in the UK education is always isn't always in the forefront of people's minds but if if you're naive about it you're, you're going to neglect it I think the ones who are really setting themselves up for success will always have that at the back of their mind Do you still get calls from Munster? Um, we're actually just setting up the uh, if you want to call it an alumni in terms of just past players right. it's something going to be a bit it, it's uh, just I suppose a bit independent nearly of Munster like where we're just getting together um, we have that social side of things and we've tried uh, in the past kind of uh, getting together um, for matches you, you know but sometimes it doesn't suit all groups it was the 10 year um, the 2008 team 10 year kind of get together over in Spain I didn't get to get there but great uh, um, it was a great weekend by all accounts and then 2006 team had another get together and uh, so we probably don't get together as much as we probably should. Um, um, so with this if you get an alumni would it be almost to formalise that you'll have your nights out and you'll have your bit of crack but also as people move through their lives now if they yeah. do fall on hard times we uh, can well, properly come together and support them? Yeah, well, I, I, not so much like that. It's, um, that, that. I suppose that's kind of the remit nearly of the players, the Irupa, right. the Rugby Players Ireland. Um, um, but it's more kind of just if we can kind of get together, you know, from a professional point of view. Like I was saying to you, like all those soft skills in kind of everyday life that people outside of sport that have naturally kind of acquired mm. that... Um, um, we, we probably need to brush up a small bit on because there, there's probably a lot of the, the skills in terms of working in whether it's mm. an elite team environment or an, as part like an, an elite, like a successful like business environment. A lot of the skills that we're kind of aware of or need to nearly be there, um, we're probably astutely aware of. But it's like I say, all the other soft skills that come in every day. Like Are there specific things that you've sort of felt over the last few <laughs> years that, you, that you've been missing? Uh, well, like the, to be honest, uh, I'm a terrible storyteller. And uh, so basically, um, like my, my wife, uh, like uh, Jill, uh, if, there, if I'm ever sending out an email um, in terms of the tone of message, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I, could be, I could be ringing her at work and... Uh, um, it was just like, have you checked that email yet? And she's like, um, I can't. I'm quite busy now. <laughs> and uh, but like, uh, yeah, like she, she, those sort of things that are, are taken for granted that um, she that comes quite naturally to her, and she's um, excellent at that. I just um, I kind of just go, okay, you need to look after that. But there are all these other like that's just I suppose one example really, you know. Yeah, Kevin, what was the biggest adjustment then you've had to make? Obviously, your weekly life continued. You're still teaching in the school. What what's what's been the hardest part? Sure. Yeah. Um, I suppose you know, as as a Gaelic football player, you have that kind of persona or that profile, and next thing you have your you know your private life as well, and. Um, you know, people still kind of want to talk to you about how me they're doing and how, you know, what do you think of Super 8s and things like that. But, you know, your personal life comes to the front all, all of a sudden um, and you need, you need to prioritise that. Um, you know, going back to what the lads were saying there, um, in terms of upskilling and development, I think the Gaelic Players Association have been huge um, in facilitating that transition. Um, and and uh, like uh, Arupa, they're, they're looking ahead for the players um, in, in fairness to them in, very, in, in various different aspects. One of them, I suppose, being the Jim Madden Leadership Programme that, that they have uh, running. Um, I would have engaged in it last year and followed on then. There's an accreditation through... What Manu is that? Um, the Jim Madden Leadership mm. Programme. It's a programme um, for current and past intercounty uh, Gaelic footballers, um, along with the WGPA, are on board as well. Um, and 
they it's they run through a program different aspects of leadership um, you know there's master classes to run you through a development center looking at your strengths and areas of development in terms of all different aspects of leadership and it's uh, kind of to upskill and prepare you for uh, different challenges that l you might face in life or in business as well as sport um, and as I said there's an accreditation process uh, through Manit University as well at the end of it all which I I hopefully will uh, graduate this December from that. Um, you know, so it's, it's wonderful that these, um, I, I suppose, um, opportunities are in place um, for, for the players. Um, and again, it's, you see an awful lot of players, um, you know, because they're so engrossed in their sport um, and they give wholeheartedly to it, when they finish, um, you know, unlike professional sport, uh, where you might have uh, a few quid at the end of it, um, Gaelic players have nothing. Um, so, and we would have seen that from time to time, and there's some some great stories there. Um, you know, from guys going back and upskilling through the help and support of the GPA um, and getting their professional life then off the ground, you know. Mm. Um, so it's wonderful to have that opportunity then and, and that the Gaelic Players Association are looking after us. One thing that strikes me there when, when you're talking about maybe the conversations you're having with your wife and you were saying how you, you have a lot more time now with the mm. kids and at home, do you need to get into your head that somehow you can't be as selfish when you're no longer <laughs> an elite sports person? <laughs> because I guess everything is, understandably, yeah. if you're not going to weddings, you're not going to go out for a drink, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do this, and you can justify pretty much anything, I would imagine, because you're focused on the next game, you're focused on being right. Yep. That excuse yeah, the, is gone. The excuses <laughs> get less and less. <laughs> Um, the biggest challenge... Uh, for excuses. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest challenge I find, if, if there is something to be done, especially when you have two small children at home, um, you need to give them your full focus and attention because if not, and I'm sure everybody can relate to it, um, that they'll be pulling out of you, they'll be uh, jumping on top of you, you know, so... And you do kind of... You can kind of get frustrated at that as well, you know, but I think, you know, it's wonderful that you can give them the, your your full support and, and, and attention, you know. It's a working process on my part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want to talk anymore about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, lads, brilliant stuff. Uh, obviously, that, and listen, you were very honest with the way you still feel about your career. You you can see it from the other side now, I guess, with your work with Motivate and with Enda McNulty, uh, as to how you should probably deal with that. Like, how much have you learned over the last six months working with Enda about, about not letting that rule your life? Yeah, listen, Nathan, that's, I am bitter about it, but that's not to say that when I look back on my career, I'm not extremely proud of what I've achieved. You know, I was, I was capped internationally up under the 21s. I played in every league outside of the Premier League. I played in the FA Cup, the League Cup. Uh, I'm very proud. So it's, uh, like um, the lads were saying earlier, it's, it's nearly like a grieving process and it's getting over it now. The work I'm doing at McNulty Performance is very fulfilling and, you know, there's a huge aspect of that um, focus on sport and, you know, helping people in regards to becoming a better athlete and regards to, there's a massive part of that in regards to transition after life after sport and helping professional sports people with that. Um, Enda's been excellent. Enda's, you know, really taught me a lot since I've gone in. Like Ian was saying, some of the softer skills, you know, I'm used to working in teams, I'm used to setting targets, I'm used to working hard, I'm used to being disciplined, but there's probably little aspects that Enda's helped me with. Um, and I guess he's been able to draw on, on experiences of people that he would have worked with previously and how they've transitioned from sport into, into the business world. And, and, and that's really guided me. And we have a very strong team down at McNulty Performance, a very close-knit team who work closely together. And that's probably similar to what you would have had in a, in a football dress room, obviously a little more PG and <laughs> probably certain things that you can't say or do in an office that you could do in a football dress room, but that has definitely eased the transition and because I'm so involved in sports still, that's, that's helped me. Lads, great stuff. Uh, we're getting really good response in on the text. Thanks a lot for coming in today. The Saturday panel, it'll be up online on offtheball.com if you want to listen back. We're going to take a quick break and then we're heading to Carnoustie to get the latest on the Open. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. Bobby's Late Breakfast. This Sunday.